folks, thank you for staying. Um, we have this incredible panel led by some of my heroes in theater, Luisa Alfaro. It's led by Andrew Sierra Romero, That's participating great. in Luisa Alfaro, <coughs> Shelly Morada, Italia Cruz. Um, Anne Garcia Romero is author of a new book called The Fornes Frame. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon, as part of our free cafecito mixer series, we're going to be having Adriana Seban and Carolyn Zeller and, uh, and herself reading some excerpts from the book. It's free to the public and sponsored by the Manta Bakery. We hope that you will attend. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for our panel. Some people that were with Irene at Padua would join the group, <laughs> Kelly Stewart, people like Leon Martel, but also there was a lot of new people that were being Irene, uh, introduced to Irene at the beginning. So I think in that first group, Han Ong, uh, Naomi Zuka, Bridget Carpenter, who went on to, you know, now she has this amazing Friday Night Lights life, you know, now in, in film and television. A really sort of amazing group, Milcha. Yeah. Milcha. 
This is going to turn to like memory lane. I can really <laughs> just curious about being in class. Um, and so uh, this this workshop really was a sort of extraordinary workshop. Uh, I stayed with the workshop for 11 years, mm -hmm. and uh, you know every year you kind of check in with Irene. And uh, Irene would come. She'd come for like six weeks and then leave, and then uh, we'd take somebody else on. And uh, it was a group that Irene suggested, so she had impeccable taste. So right after Irene, we had Paula Vogel, mm -hmm. then we had Mac Wellman, Len Jenkins, mm -hmm. Connie Condon. So these are all you can see of the school, right? And it was an amazing time, and it was an extraordinary learning experience for me. So really, uh, that's I don't have an academic history, although I'm a tenure professor. Don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> really, I, it was in workshop that I that I came into my own as a writer, and especially with Irene. I think of Irene as the workshop leader of my life and the mentor. Because it's true that what she would do so brilliantly was create an exercise that got you over the hump, or that it that allowed you to just open into the space. And I think that really changed me. So I'm going to jump forward really, really quick because I think that I see a kind of Irene that I started with, with her mom, mm -hmm. and we would put out four chairs, and her mom would lay down and you would read, <laughs> and if you could get something out of Frankie, you were very excited, you know, and sometimes she would throw up a thumb, you know, and when I wrote in Spanish, she would like go like this, you know, and so there's something very powerful about the community of that. But um, I was at the Marte Perform for 10 years, some of you know, and uh, we ran a program called the Latino Theater Initiative, and the last thing we did was a large, we took the rest of our money and did a large uh, Latino uh, Writers Weekend at Plaza de la Raza. And it was the last time that I we had a kind of really LA moment with Irene. And I bring it up because I think it was the then and the now that really sort of shaped how I see her. So that weekend, I remember we put everybody up in Pasadena. We were at Plaza, we had this nights of eating and writing and everybody and their mother seemed to be there, a lot of folks. And um, I had a, I rented a van and Jorge Cortinas and Eduardo Machado. It was, a, it was a crazy group. And there was a lot of disagreements and a lot of joy in the room. Um, but anyway, Irene uh, was staying at the hotel and I get a call the morning of her big playwriting workshop that she's supposed to do it. And the, the front desk calls me and says, Irene's checked out of her room and uh, so we don't know where she is. So I was like, oh, I'm coming to pick her up. So I'm totally freaking out, right? So I take this van, and in the middle of taking the van, I crash the van, too. So it was very dramatic, right? Because I'm a Latino, right? So we take the, the, take the van and go to this hotel in Pasadena. I can't find her. Can't find her. She's checked out. And I just do an Irene exercise, right? Which was to visualize where she might be in that moment. And right out there she is at the pool with, <laughs> with her suitcase, standing there in her little hat. And I, and I went up to her and I said, hi, Irene. And she goes, are we in Cuba? And I said, no, we're in Pasadena, California. And you're about to do a playwriting workshop. And I'm worried that you cannot do it. And so I, I need to know uh, right now if you, you think you, and she's very good, very good. Everybody needs to do it. Yeah. And uh, she said, um, yeah, I can do it. So I said, OK. And then she looked at me and she said, so you're my friend? I said, I'm your student and I'm your friend. And she said, okay, so got in the car, we went to Lincoln Heights, and she did this, um, what I think of my sort of seminal moment with Irene, we had this extraordinary workshop. I think Anne was there, yeah, it was a very important moment. And one of the playwrights, I won't say who, uh, was reading, started laughing, and Irene didn't realize there was a nervous mechanism. And Irene said, why are you laughing at your work? And she said, oh, I'm not laughing at my work, it's just, I'm nervous. And she said, well, I think it's bigger than that. I think you don't take the work serious. So when you do that, you you deny yourself the power of your, your writing. You deny yourself the power of your work. You know? So it's this amazing speech you gave, completely in the moment, elusive and focused, and said, go back. And I remember we went back, and, and this person read the work, and it was powerful. And it was one of those great Irene moments. So we have this workshop, we get in the van, we go to LAX, and Jorge Cortinas is going to sit next to Irene, and we get off, and Irene said, I, I don't know who you are right now, but I know you're a friend of mine, and I'm so happy we had this great time together. And she gave me a kiss. And that was the last I saw of Irene. And I have to say, I'm a bit of a coward, because I just haven't been able to go back. I see Irene in a, in a kind of light, you know, in a kind of extraordinary light. 
and my light with Irene is the, the moment of, I, you know, I was a performance artist, so with Irene, it was all about the this, right? <laughs> we have these exercises you see do, right? And they were uh, amazing because you did these kind of silly things. We went into the class and, you know, and then, right, remember this? Right? And so you do these balance, and it was all about the yoga. And I think what was really happening was that I was focusing, focusing, focusing into being a writer. And the exercise really helped with that. It was a way of saying, take yourself serious. Get in the moment. Who are you? And never told me how to write, just every time I was uh, kind of stuck, she had an exercise. And it was uh, things that I do now, lists. Uh, visual images, um, a poem, you know, draw. And so I, I was one of those writers that liked to just hear the sound of my own voice. So she would say, you know, draw first and then write so you can get to the point. Because you're like, <laughs> and then in the drawing, I would kind of like do all the periphery, right? So it was that kind of stuff that I think really shifted and changed the way that I, I got focused about my writing and I got clear about the kind of writing I was doing. But maybe the most, most important thing that happened was in 1995, Irene, we were in a workshop, and Han Ong got really mad, and he raced out of the class, and he was like, don't tell me what to do. And they always had a kind of mother-son weird thing going on. And you always get a relationship with Irene, you know? You get that, you can't help it. You want to be, she nurtures, you know? You want to be nurtured, and then she's not, and it was a lot of interesting stuff. So anyway, she said, what kind of play do you want to write? Because you've now been with me for, I think it was two years. And I said, well, you know, I've been arrested 16 times for civil disobedience, and I protest everything. At the time, I was in Queer Nation, and I, you know, I used to lay down on the floor and shut down avenues and all that stuff. And she said, so, uh, so, and I said, well, so I want to write political plays. And she said, ugh. Because <laughs> I hate people write political plays. <laughs> the irony is that once you read her plays, you're like, bitch, you're political. <laughs> But of course, you can't say that to your teacher, right? And, uh, so she said, I, I'm going to ask you to do something. And maybe the hardest thing I've ever asked a writer to do is stop writing. Mm -hmm. So go off and live your politics. Go do that. Go do that thing. And then come back and then write a story. I promise you, write a story about a rock. I promise you it will be political. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I stopped, which was a hard thing for me to do. And I went to work for SEIU, Service Employees International Union. So I was a union organizer for LA Unified School District. And then I ran an AIDS hospice in South Central called The Gathering Place. Yeah. So lots of images of death, lots of images of, of tension, and conflict, all the things we want in a play. And then I came back to Irene's workshop and the writing took off. Like the writing got clear, the stories got clear, the form got clear, everything kind of went like, so the remaining years with Irene were really about uh, a word that she used to use with me, get more sophisticated with it, get, get clear with it. You're, you have like one word and you're not expanding the word, right? Yeah. So I had an experience where she told Mac Wellman to take me out and talk to me, which I thought was interesting. And I didn't know that her and Mac Wellman, I guess they were good friends, right? Mm -hmm. And so Mac Wellman and I went to a bar on Beverly. You guys must know this bar, Mexican Catina place. On Beverly, El Coyote? Near what? El Coyote? El Coyote, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we went to El Coyote and got wasted. <laughs> wasted. And, and Mac says, you know, you're not very well read and that's gonna haunt you. So, you know, yeah, that was the part. And, uh, and he said, so I have a list that Irene and I have put together. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on a napkin because we're drunk, you know? <laughs> Pass the back, the napkin. And, you know, I crumpled it because I was super ashamed and then bumped my way back to the Oakwood apartments where he was staying, you know, because in the old days you used to be able to bump cars on your way home drunk. And then, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the old days, right? And then, so, I look at the list and it's the first... The first piece on the list is the Bible. The second piece is the Quran. It was crazy. And then there was fantastic things in there. You know, Connie Congdon's play, uh, one of her most famous plays, and I'm forgetting it right now. Tales of the Lost from Icons. Tales of the Lost from Icons. You know, it was like this work that was speaking directly to me. This work that was about my sensibility, about my sense of humor, about where I belonged in the world. 
And I think that in the end, this is the thing that I took from Irene. She helped me find my tribe. And I think this is the thing that's the hardest thing for us in our communities is finding our tribes, you know? I know that I belong to my Latino tribe, but even within my Latino tribe, we have different sensibilities, different aesthetics, right? And so, uh, you know, it's been years and years, I feel, of like bumping along with Cherie, I've known, oh my God, these two I've known so long and have known them through their work. So in a way, you're kind of feeling your way, finding through. And Irene just created not the, not the, desti not the, the destination, but the actual path that opened. And never told me what to write. Never once told me what to write. And I always found that very interesting. I think there was moments in class where uh, something very specific would happen. And it was the only time I heard her speak Spanish in class. And she would say something in Spanish to me, like, like, um, uh, uh, she had a, like a very interesting kind of Cuban word for like, slow it down, you know, like things like that. And those were moments where I felt they were very personal. They were very personal that she was talking just to me, you know. And those moments really resonated for me. But, it, but in the end, I think it is this, this journey that I try to do now in my work with, with, with people I teach is, uh, I don't want you to write like me, I want to help facilitate a journey for your own process. And what is that journey? And so can we uh, introduce the authentic? Can we find the authentic in each other? And can we use that as a way to move through? So I do spend a lot of time doing the, the Irene thing, which is to diagnose. I don't think she ever would have used that word. But I think she diagnosed me and my condition as a writer. And then she knew what to do. And so that's the thing I get in most trouble for at school, because you know in those first four weeks you can jump in and out of the class, right? And so I use that first four weeks and I don't give out the syllabi, and then the, the administration just goes nuts, right? And I always say, I can't give out the syllabi because I'm building it for the student. So I'm diagnosing them and trying to very quickly get them to their most authentic self so I know what they need. And that's the way I work now. I work completely intuitive and completely doing the Irene Fornes method, right? So when I say that I bring Irene into the room, she is in the room. She is guiding in the exercise. It is in that spirit. It is the yoga that is getting us uh, centered and focused. It is the creating a space. It's about thinking of the holiness of our writing, which is the thing I never thought about. I always thought the writing, it is a business and it is a technical craft. But it's also the way you talk to God if you're a playwright or if you're a poet. It's the way you commune. It's in the spirit. So uh, that is the thing. How do we get to the spirit? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> you notice I still need the affirmation? <laughs> is it okay? <laughs> Well, I, I, I love that you um, left with the word spirit, right? Um, I have a million, I mean, I feel, I feel like I'm overwhelmed with things to say about um, Maria Irene, and I don't know, and I always called her Maria Irene, mm. and so she would talk back to me in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And that was my little trick. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and not that I am fabulous in Spanish, but um, I wanted to be special to her. And um, and I, when every time I said Maria Irene, she go, you know, it was like, of course, because no, everybody called her Irene, you know. And um, also because um, I worked with her at Intar, uh, it was was it 1982, three, which is what was it? Four. 84. Four. Yes. Okay, 84. <laughs> 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 Together, we were there together. There was three women, Ana Maria Simo, and the two of us. And um, uh, there's ten people, so the rest were men. And um, <laughs> and the play you just saw was um, the application for um, to be in her workshop. And um, I'd never written a play in my life, and knew nothing about it. Um, at one time with this play, Giving Up the Ghost, I had had a reading of it and somebody started, and this is going to be really shameful, but somebody said to me, oh, I can see your um, Garcia Lorca influence. I said, who? <laughs> 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 and I'm not saying that because I'm proud of my um, 
lack of education, um, but uh, I think that um, that without Irene, I thought Irene's everybody else is doing it right now. No, without Maria Dennis, mm -hmm. I would not. Um, uh, I would never have written any theater because she was. I always feel like with her, um, she had the eyes to see what my intention was. She had the eyes to see, um, like you just said it, like it's so individual, how she reads you. You said diagnosis, and how she reads you, you know. I was terrified, I brought in this little, you know, and I brought in this play that I didn't know what the hell it was. Yet it certainly, it just, I have always written, I wrote poetry and I wrote um, essays. And after my first book, when I was done, all of a sudden Cork started speaking to me. And I went, oh my God, this um, is, uh, this, person speaking is not me and um, has a body. And that was, to me, the making of writing plays, you know. And I think also because as first generation writers that our tradition is oral. And um, suddenly, um, I, I knew that. In, uh, I didn't know Garcia Lorca. I knew our tradition was oral. So it's just storytelling, you know. But, but that, but somehow, and I went to New York, and some, I ended in New York on a story, but, but this, um, I didn't even, I knew nothing about Maria Irene, you know, I just knew that she was doing this, this uh, playwriting workshop, and I wanted to learn about it. So, many things to say, so I'm gonna try to kind of <coughs> organize sort of how I wanna say this, that um, uh, I also credit the fact that um, the Dalí was in that class. Um, uh, because um, what I felt about Magdalia uh, being in that class with me, Ana, Ana Maria Simo was there too, but this was, th this sister, you know, she was so young, and um, I was young too, but she was young too. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I knew que sufre, you know. I was in the class and I knew que está sufriendo. And I'm saying it perfectly in Spanish because Spanish wasn't really allowed in her workshop um, unless you spoke perfect Spanish. Um, and if you were monolingual English, that's cool. Monolingual Spanish, cool. Our Chicano Spanglish was out the door. Right? <laughs> Our first fight. Our first fight. Maria Irene and I have many confrontations of great heart. And, um, but with Natalia in that, I felt like, oh my God, this woman, this teacher is holding a place for this sister. And uh, I knew she had to write. I knew she had to write. And I knew I had to write. And this woman would allow that space, that the stakes were that high, that if we didn't write, we were not going to um, do well in this life. And, um, and she held it, she just held it, just held it. Make sure your tables touch. That was her whole thing, you had a, the, there was 10 tables, remember 10 wooden tables and we had these little wooden tables. And all the tables had to touch in the circle to make sure that the vibration was going all the way around. I thought she was crazy. <laughs> 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 but, but also, what I really learned from her, and this is kind of an important kind of teaching principle, I think, around playwright in particular, is that if anybody came in, this is my memory, and it could, I just had this one time with her, and then later she directed one of my plays, which I want to talk about too, but the, that what I remember with her is the dudes would all come in with like these plot lines all worked out. Oh, she hated that. I mean, she would just throw them out of the room. <laughs> and I went, Amazing, because I thought I couldn't write a play because I didn't have my progressive plot line in order. You know your notes, right? Mm -hmm. And and what she taught me, and this is I've taught writing for many, many, many years, and and I really appreciate you honoring your students here, you know, because that is the greatest gift. You know, but what she taught me fundamentally is that you find your work. The work finds you. You know, it's like you find your work. The work finds you. You don't come in with an agenda, because um, and um, uh, I want to uh, honor my ex-student, who's now my director, Misha, because he's been in many of my classes, and, um, and you know, all the time, this process of 
of finding, you know, is, is like, like the, and the idea that you do exercises, you don't do these MFA stuck up programs where everybody comes in and critiques their work and then who's competing about who's critiquing better and they have all the language from the MFA programs and none of that had a place in Eileen's workshops. And what she taught me is that every person, what your job is, that's what you said, is to read the person. So sometimes people will share work, and you always do exercises in class. Everything, you have to surprise, you have to trick people into finding the work. And you have to trick people to get their ego out of the way. And their ego is so much less intelligent than their um, unconscious. So, so that's what Irene did without ever talking about it. You know, like she, she just would trick you into digging up the dirt, digging up the stuff. And, um, so I have always, that principle is something I have never uh, forgotten and I've applied in every, every genre I've ever taught. Um, uh, it, and uh, the principle of that um, to me has been the most gratifying thing because I see the work that comes as a result of that. Um, so that's what I didn't want to say. I was about teaching. I had a little dim in my head. The other thing I want to say <laughs> is that she scared the holy hell out of me as a writer because I, I um, uh, through a series of great fortune, before she was really directing other people's plays very much, she directed my play Shadow of a Man, which was a play I had developed in that uh, workshop with her. And, um, and, uh, uh, she came to San Francisco uh, to direct its premiere, right? And so I think I just told somebody else a story. The other day, but like, so I thought the play, you know, was, oh, I'm good, man. You know, he wants to do my play. I'm good, you know, it's really good, like that. <laughs> and um, so I remember we were in this Salvadoreño restaurant, she and I, and uh, so I, know, I can't do her, but I remember. So I had my play, it was my first meeting. And I think we're going to go right into production with my totally cool play, right? <laughs> <laughs> so she says to me, she says, you know, a play is like a, a plane. And you've got to have the wing in the right place and the other wing in the right place. And if that tail is not in the right place, it's just like <laughs> 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 watching my play. <laughs> So we started this series of, of um, rewrites. Um, we started a series of rewrites. <laughs> and she'd send me, I, you know, I'd give her work. She'd send me home. Okay, come tomorrow, bring me your rewrites, you know. And I would be just like um, terrified uh, because I, it really was a sense I didn't, like, you know, the part of you that wants to hold to your intention, you know. And then somebody says they can they can get you there, but you you know you know you're also holding to yourself. And I appreciate that about my students. Like what you're trying to hold, it's really yours. It's not somebody else's, right? And I remember one one point, very particular point. So she, I would bring her the work, and then she'd go, she'd read it, you know, <laughs> and then she said she'd say, and then she got her pen. I mean, you know, it's like, I'm like, you know, and those are, the, and she would find the heart of the scene, right, mm -hmm. that was in there all the time, right? And so also teaching me how to find, you know, the heart of the scene. And I, I just, it, but it was so scary. And so at one point, and we also, you know, like, these Chicanos are particular kind of people. And, and I was in New York when I did this work, and there wasn't any Chicanos in that, in that, um, that I knew of had been there yet. I may have been the first, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know Chicago. Yeah. No but, shows before you, but I don't know if I call her Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Huh? Leo. Yeah. But, but Leo, but Leo's not a Chicago. I mean. You were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so all I knew is that I had these, these, these plays, the plays were also had some Spanish in it. And everybody was, I mean, she was not, and it wasn't until there was a reading, I was stuck reading it because my actor left, you know. And then she, and this is what I love about Irene, is that she said, I'm sorry. 
I didn't hear, I didn't, mm. I couldn't hear it. But now that I can hear it, you go ahead. You know, like that. <laughs> and it, that was really an important moment, right? And so, so her, just her, her process like that was always one of great, um, uh, we fought, you know, I mean, at one point where she had said to me, um, she's talking about my characters, and I'm really feeling like she, don't, she doesn't get it, she doesn't get it. Like I'm protecting my people. That's how I felt, you know? I just felt like I was protecting my people. It was class, it was all this kind of stuff, and you know. And right or wrong, that's how I felt. And then she says to me one time, so she goes, they're primitive people, they're just primitive, like that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm just like, you know, you're talking about my family, my, you know, it's like all of this stuff. And I, and I get really angry at her, you know, and I say, you don't get them, you don't get them. And she says, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. And I go, boy, I'm really stupid. You know, and I don't mean that as a joke. I mean that what she was saying was something much deeper, you know, than my um, politics, right? Mm -hmm. My politics. And she, wanted, she didn't want me to be stupid in my politics. She wanted me to go to the place of an artist, right? And when she said she was primitive, I go, I'm, I don't even know if I know what she means. But intuitively, there was something going on there. And um, this last thing I want to say is that, um, you know, my mother passed of Alzheimer's. And so um, when I knew she was ill like that, I had experience, same experience you had, where I saw her here where they were doing some award for her here, uh, the Macho Organization or something. And um, she said the same thing to me, it's so beautiful, you know, that she says, you know, I know we had, I, I know, I, I know you, but I don't know you, but I know I really loved you, you know, and I'm going, it's like, but, but the thing that she, t you know, and then with my, my mother, I went to go see her, and, um, and um, she, uh, you know, she likes to be sung to, and, um, and, I, I, I think that there's some amazing thing, you know, because we're all going out too, you know? And there's an amazing thing about being a maestra. And, um, and, and that moment in which uh, I just think, you know, it's great how everybody sets this up when you go to see her because they give you suggestions of how to talk to her. But I remember with my mom, so I'm just, you know, like this, this, and she, you know, and I have to say, you know, Maria Irene is queer, you know? She's a lesbian, you know? And that really matters. It really matters. Partly the reason why she can write the way she writes has something to do with, with that, like that she's almost vulgar sometimes. She's almost like mud, you just wanna go, I mean, it's so grossero on a certain level. And there's something about that uh, lack of censorship where she's able to go like to the, just go to that without that censor that really feels queer to me. Um, and that we learn to kind of um, clean up. But she wasn't clean in that way. And I think that's why she gave some of us that really needed it, the space to work. She knew that I thought I knew how to write plays. <laughs> so she, uh, she made me her assistant, which meant I was basically her slave. I made coffee, and I, I tape recorded her with a cassette tape. And I went home every night after writing and trying to transcribe my own work. I transcribed her words. And those exercises that she was teaching, like, got inside me. And I kept thinking, I got taught wrong. I kept thinking, like, all my intellect was like, my, I thought my brain was like short circuiting or something when I was with Irene. I was like, you're telling me the opposite. It's like, you know, somebody has told me to put my underwear on wrong the whole time of my life. <laughs> Why didn't somebody tell me? <laughs> I had my skirt jacked up into my pantyhose and people were laughing at me this whole time. I didn't understand at all how to write a play. 
And uh, so she let me do it for a few weeks. And she kept saying, you're glib. That's horrible. That's not funny. And, we're like, and I was just like, oh my god, she's going to kick me out. So I was like, maybe I can stay and just make coffee. <laughs> I was terrified. I was like, you know, she's, she's like, she's a goddess. She don't want to, you know, mess with her. And Cherie scared the shit out of me. I was like, oh my god. I'm from the South Bronx, and this woman scares me. <laughs> I never understood what she kind of meant till I met. Her. <laughs> and she and she also started pick on me a little bit. I was like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> you did. <laughs> so I was like, so one day I was just like, okay, I'm not gonna write. I thought, you know, I'm not gonna write. I was writing. I was writing a science fiction play for God's sake. <laughs> I'm writing, and so I'm like, I can't write this shit anymore. Why, why am I writing this? Why did I, what, what am I doing here, right? Who yeah. am I? And so I started, I was like, I just started writing essays. I was like, this is what happened this day in my life. This is what happened when I was eight. This is what happened when I was ten. This is when I really first wanted to write, when my best friend was raped and murdered and thrown off the roof of my house. That's when I knew I had to be a writer. So I was like, what the fuck am I writing about? Science fiction is not fiction. And it ain't science. Yeah. <laughs> Humanity. And, um... And secrets, and secrets that you need to tell in order to tell the truth. So when I started writing this, I'm like, huh. I had to read at the end of it, of course, and I'm, of course I'm crying like this. And he was like, you found me writing today. And I was like, <laughs> the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> like, suddenly I felt like, you know, your, your fingers just start coming out of your hand, and, you're, and it's like, whoa, okay. I don't have to hide who I am. I don't have to hide who we are. Mm -hmm. I don't have to pretend I don't come from the South Bronx. I don't have to pretend I don't have, you know, eight cousins in jail. I don't have to pretend I know murderers and I love them. I don't have to pretend that I know rapists and I love them. I don't have to pretend that I know rapists who are family members, who rape family members, who I hate. I don't have to pretend and hide and, I don't know, and think I'm a writer, whatever that was. So um, I remember uh, Irene said, well, I think what you finally found today is that the way to be a writer for you is to, um, to keep looking back. Keep remembering that your ancestors are always with you. And keep remembering to honor what you've known. And as you move forward and you learn, you just keep incorporating the past. For you, it's the past. It's not the present. It's not the future. It's like the key to what you need to say is like in your bones. And you find the bones and you excavate them and you expose them and they're going to stink. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. So, um, so that's what Irene taught me. To go to a story about Irene directing. Um, I, was, I forget what play it was. <coughs> I think it was The Have Little. I was having a production in HR and Irene was supposed to direct it. And... Uh, we were having our first direct meeting. I was like, Irene, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm going to fire you. She said, what? <laughs> I said, oh, if I let you direct my play, you know what's going to happen? You're going to write my play for me. And I'm not strong enough to say no to you. I admire you too much. I love you. I, you're brilliant. You're a goddess. I am not. You know, and I need to, I need to separate from you to be who I am. She's like, oh, you're stupid. I'm the best actor. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, like, I know that, and I, you know, I accept my stupidity, but I also feel like I need to protect what I have and what, who I am and what the fuck I'm saying. And even if I say it badly, it's what I'm saying. It's not what you're saying. Because I just like felt like we were twinning. Like at one point, it was like me and her, and was like, ah, get away from me. And, but she taught me so much, and, I, and it was like, oh, it was so painful to say no. You cannot direct my play. And I was like, can you, I'm, I can't believe I was, it was coming out of my mouth. And she was like, well, you know, lots of people want me to direct my, their, your play. And she was so mad at me. And it, she took like six months for her to talk to me again, I think, after that. She was so angry. And, um, but I think in the end that, that we, we parted at that point with this sort of feeling of mutual respect. And, and I still think she thought I was stupid because I never wanted really to direct my own plays. She thought that was always dumb, that, there, that a writer, the originating... Uh, creator would not want to control everything about their play. I was like, I'm not a designer. You know, I don't know. I like, and I also, because I carry so much, I'm such an empath, and the things I write about are very painful. It's like, I need people in the room, or I will go crazy. <laughs> so I need, I need like, I need, I need grounding, and uh, I can't do that on my own. 
So, and I, and I recognize that about myself. So, you know, unapologetically, I do not direct my plays. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, but I do always want to be in the room where the my play is being done, because like, it's almost like a mother. Like, I want to make sure I'm there to give them the milk. If somebody hurts them, I want to take them out of the room <laughs> and, uh, and I protect them. But I also, it's, it's also important to let your kids go off and do their own thing when you go to college. <laughs> 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 Even though I'll be following her in an airstream <laughs> with a mask on. So that's Irene. I mean, I think, I, I think that's the main thing is that she taught me how to tell the truth and really uh, honor my ancestors and honor who I am, who I forgot to be in that weird intellectual place that is an MFA program and a BFA program and all those things that I did that I, and I still didn't know. Like nobody knew, like, you know, I'm from the Bronx and the Bronx is burning. It's like so cliche or something now, but it's like I grew up in rubble. You know, and I and you know, and among the rubber there was the, the safety of the family, and then when I got to Irene's class, there was the safety of the class because in a way, those circles that I, that Shetty was talking about, that our tables touching, it's like uh, today I'm going to church, and this is the church of all of our collective souls, mm -hmm. and you know there was somebody there was you know me and Shetty and uh, a Cuban, you know, it's, uh, Ana Maria Simo is Cuban, mm -hmm. Shetty Chicana, Puerto Rican, Juan Shamsulalam, New York Rican, uh, Oscar Colon. Old, old time Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were all these people in the classroom, Lorenzo Mans, who's Cuban. There was all these nationalities. We were from all parts of the country, and, and somehow we were all telling stories that that were that were um, I don't know that were given a visceral um, foundation by each other. It's like I don't know your story, but I can feel your story because it. And in, in fact, it's like almost like we were all in like a creating this like mutual earth where we like we were planted and then we could all be ourselves. It's like, okay, uh, you know, we're right here and, and this moves forward. And I spoke really bad Spanish. Irene always made fun of me about my Spanish. But that was okay because I kept thinking if I don't, because I'm so sensitive, and it was like sometimes I couldn't even speak because I would just sort of felt like attacked all the time. And I was like, that's all right, I'm just gonna write, I'm gonna have to write something really beautiful so that she'll leave me alone. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I tried. I think that's, that's probably me. I was thinking a little bit of just about their relationship, but uh, I, I, we were in the workshop and she was talking about Nilo and she, she specifically said, I'm sorry to bring him up because I don't want to influence you. And uh, so, you know, as I think about it, we didn't, I don't remember having, like, I think we read this, these poems that she would bring in, but she would take off the author name. Oh, wow. So, because we would do exercises wow. based on them. So that's kind of interesting. I, yeah, I don't remember her saying, you should, or you should read this writer or something like that. Yeah, she talked about Beckett once, because that was her first influence, and when she first went to Paris, she saw La Tendance Godot, and that's what made her want to write uh, a play. And she wrote her play, you know, stealing lines from a cookbook while she was waiting for Susan Sontag to come back. Come home. Her, her, yeah, come home. And, uh, you know, 
questions. So teaching her, teaching about the specific specificity of randomness is something she talked about. Mm -hmm. For me, she wanted, she thought she wanted me, she thought I read too many books already. She was like, just stop. <laughs> 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 Don't read anymore, you have to write. <laughs> you, uh, you got ideas, you got too many ideas. So, that was our relationship. <laughs> Uh, and Luis, you mentioned that when you went to pick her up at the, at the hotel in Pasadena, what year, and she didn't know where she was, what year? We do that? 2001. 2001. Yeah. So, it, so that's when she, did, we, we've all been wondering, when did she begin her decline? Yeah, her remember, when I picked her up, then, you know, that pool scene was so powerful, mm -hmm. but you know, it was equally as powerful because it was so funny. So I had to check her back into the hotel, right? Mm -hmm. So I check her into the hotel, we go, and she goes, oh my goodness. I just stayed in a room just like this. <laughs> and I was like, yes. So, you know, I think one of the things that's extraordinary about her was, uh, you know, all these things you said, Sheree, I don't remember you, that, that she she takes all that pressure off of you, you know, and, yeah. and she really did that with us, uh, just that yeah. scene at the airport and all that, you know, but she would really take the pressure off of your fear of the fact that she was starting to not remember folks. I remember we were at South Coast Rep, I don't know if you remember this, for, an event, for a HPV. Mm -hmm. And she was a special respondent, which was also really hilarious. So <laughs> this was a hilarious story. Somebody was reading their play, and then she said, uh, from the audience, she goes, I think that you should maybe get rid of 50% of this play. And then the playwright was on stage and said, 50%? <laughs> and she goes, no, I'm sorry, 75. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious moment. And then afterwards, I remember the playwright went up to Irene and said, Irene, like, I've known you for so long, and Irene said, oh. And it was like a little moment that I remember where it was like, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure she, she got that she, that she knew the playwright so intimately. So yeah, something in there. So 2001, how interesting. Yeah. I actually have a question. Um, I'm really curious to know what the effects of her visualization and drawing in her in workshops, how that has informed your work as therapists and teachers. I know for me, it's a really revolutionary way to teach, to, to go inside into the subconscious, and it's anti-formulaic, it's anti-establishment, and it's so, so powerful. So I'm curious to hear if you have any more reflections on how that part of her teaching method has influenced you. Well, I can't really, I don't, I remember the, the drawings and such, and it's actually not something that I use a lot. Um, I think just because that's not the aspect that, that resonated for me. And, um, but I do remember um, a moment in which she was directing my play that totally um, changed my sense about why visuals matter, you know, for the stage, right? And, and that was a moment that, um, I also just want to say, yeah, I hear you about that she can, I mean, that fight, you know, I mean, about the lines and all that. I just said, really, because we fought. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, like, ah, that's why I was like, you, I thought you did to Sharia. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yes. <laughs> but, um, but what, so she, I remember I was in a, in a rehearsal. As I said, I didn't have a, a big background in theater, you know. And so I remember she was directing, and there was a scene in which the, 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 the Manuel, well, first of all, the way she visualized that set just blew me out. I mean, it's just like, mm -hmm. I go, oh my God, this is what it's like to be a painter. Mm -hmm. that you, and, mm -hmm. and my partner is a, is a visual artist, is a painter, mm -hmm. and, and, and since like 2005, she's been designing all of my work, right? Mm -hmm. Not that I have tons of work, but, but the work that we do, I, I, it's like, and all of a sudden I'm going, oh yes, that's, because I figured it, I mean, it's like when I saw how she envisioned this, like, you know, the walls of the house being, they had to have walls, but the walls were, you know, 12 inches high, right? So you'd know that the walls meant nothing, but the walls were still there and they kept being respected as they, you know, been this incredible, I mean, everything. But, but there was a holistic quality to, and, a, and, and you said the word visceral, there's this, in, it's all, you know, now people talk about embodied practice and, you know, but I, I, I have a lot of cynicism around some of, not cynicism, but critique 
around what academic language is doing to our art practice. You know, there, and that's a long conversation. But but she knew what embodied practice was, and the so it's the viscerality of all of that. But I remember this one moment in which the this character Manuel, his wife comes to give him a cup of coffee, and he's obsessed with his his compadre, and the compadre is going to come, and he has all this resentment to his wife, and and so she brings him a cup of coffee. And he um, and Irene's telling him, okay, now you get the cup of coffee, and she gives it to you, and you don't even look at her, and you get the cup of coffee, and you, no, 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 use the back of your hand, because yes. you just yeah. move it like this. Use the back of yeah. your hand, and then I want you, but stretch your whole arm out, and you let it go across the thing, you know, like this, right? And I'm sitting in the audience, I'm watching it, and he did it, and he did it, and he did it, and I'm going, this is like such a waste of time. You know what I mean? I'm just so stupid. You know, because I'm late. But I, you know, it's like I can't, because I don't know. I don't understand, you know? And I'm there, and he's, you know, she's doing this, do, doing this, doing it, and then over and over again. And the opening night, he's going like this, and you hear it go across the table. It must take like a full, you know, 60 seconds for this thing to go. And you hear it across the table. And it's like he got that woman and just knifed her. You know what I mean? And I'm going, I mean, that that lesson alone for all, it totally changed how I thought about theater, how you write as a playwright. I'm one of the playwrights, I write my stage directions. I want people to pay attention to them. And not that, not that a director has to do that, but we're gonna have a conversation then about that vision, because I am seeing for my plays. I see the stage, you know? And 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 you know, there's a lot of people that don't. I mean, they don't think. But but Irene, I felt like like she wants you to think like a director, really. You know, because that's how she she wrote like a director. She knew that's why she directed her plays. And you know, kind of a little different than you that I I I finally started directing my plays. And not that I enjoy it, you know, but I don't. But but um, but it's because of of, of just. See, seeing now that it's an integral process, and also she gave me permission to, mm -hmm. because I feel like there, I'm just telling you, I mean, I don't write like, great, you know, I'm not like a popular playwright, so it's like, and I, I say that in a, a respectful way, but so so it means that then, that you have to, like she's, I said, she could be a bitch. Mm -hmm. She didn't care, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and as I get older, I'm going, okay. You know, it's like that there's something in like, you know, because if a, if a woman is hurt that fuerte, mm -hmm. then she's a bitch, right? Yeah. And she yeah. was such a great model of somebody who was just fuerte. She had a vision, man, woman, she didn't care. She wasn't prejudiced in that way. She wanted the best of you. And I go, wow, and you can just, you know, so when do you get old enough to say that your perception is right on, is, mm -hmm. is worth valuing, you know? And she, is, to this day, is such a model of that. And it's a it's a three dimensional writing that she really does. Mm -hmm. you know? Even though the lens can be very very kind of refined, like it's a three dimensional vision. Right. And when men do it, they're auteurs and they're geniuses. And when women do it, they're controlling mm -hmm. and bossy. Yeah. Right. yeah. I love and that. The answer to your question about the imagery, I think, is this because what I think what. Um, Sherry, you're talking about the movement. It's sort of that for me the also approach to our artistry as an artist, you know, she's a painter. Uh, right. But the imagery for me was an access to this collective that was much uh, brighter and smarter and genius and with, there was a wisdom that you could reach that was greater than oneself and myself. Mm -hmm. So when I was described to the work, it, for me she put me in a place where I would scribe rather than write. And that would mean I would record all the imagery or the imagery so that I just had to write down what I saw. And then in the end, I had this pot of information that I would go back to. And she didn't tell us how to write a play. We had to make those decisions ourselves. And, and that's what uh, she never wanted to teach us how to write a play. She just wanted us to access this imagination that was authentic, original, and the place where our own visions were interpreted into the to the electricity of it, you know, I really love what you just said. Because I think it's the 3D, that in some way she would introduce depth of space, right? right, right but just right. as a playwright, you know, you're thinking about language so much, but that Irene had a visual vision, mm -hmm. so that opened the, that, that a play doesn't happen just right here, it happens in this entire room, right? That there's that electricity. 
I have an exercise that I read that I still do that I think is really important, which is, you know, uh, when we're talking about character backstory, uh, we take a, a, the character's age and we cut the character's age in half. Something happened to, to you at your half age that informs who you are today, that informs what you did in that play tonight, right? And so that's like a really important arena exercise because it's not the exercise that itself, it's the visualization that used to go with it, where you would look at yourself and you'd remember what you looked like and what you wore, and then she'd drop in even lower and she'd say, where are you? Who else is in the room? What kind and of light is in the room? Oh, remember that? The temperature, <laughs> yeah, the temperature yeah. of what the room. What are the smells in the room? And when she'd get to the temperature, you had done like this, mm -hmm. this, and then as an actor, you're like here, right? Because you're now in the visceral of the room, right? You're now feeling the space of the room. And I love that exercise because, you know, we talk about motivations and there's always a student who's like, well, you know, the, the shooting is a surprise. Like, it is a surprise, but actually it came <coughs> from something you did when you were, that happened to you when you were 12. Yeah. Right? Or today, when, when I was listening to the most difficult piece of text that you turned into poetry, right? Assault. The, the assault that the Sarita so beautifully translated, right? I was thinking, all of that spells this ghost, this ghost that we're giving up, or all of the memory of that, you know? And so that's what she did in those exercises, you know? But I think it really was, and I wish I was better at that. Close your eyes. Where, where are you at? You know, and you do that, and you'd be like, oh, I mean, please shut up. I'm about ready to write. Are you ready to write? And she just holds it till you get so pregnant with the possibility of the story. <laughs> then you can write it, right? But I think that was a good trick. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a really good trick to do the visualization, to go back, to be in your soul, right, Nikki? The temperature. By the time you got to temperature, you were somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I had a student, uh, Julie Tyrell Oni who did a, a production of Mud at USC. And you know, we had fought and fought and fought about this. And then I remember when I went to see it, I was just crying, because it wasn't about the language, it was about the space in between the words. Mm -hmm. That she find, she loves Irene, and she finally got what I think Irene was <coughs> doing, which is all that gestural action. Yeah. The, you know, when, uh, what's that beautiful character's name in Mud? What is her name? May. 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 There is a lot of silence in that play, and for a reason, right, for a reason. And so, you know, when you look at gestural action on stage and you watch a character sit there for three, four, five minutes pondering themselves, there's, there's something very interesting about that. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. The other important thing for the workshop for me was that Irene also was writing with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, like, you learned by example, you know, when you, you, you saw her get lost in her words, and you do, we're supposed to get lost in our words, so keep writing, keep moving, keep getting deeper. And she, uh, when she talked about spending time at the actor studio and learning about method, you know, method acting, but she thought, this is what, this is the kind of exercise that would benefit writers so much. Mm -hmm. How deep can you go? What do you remember? You know, and grounding your characters in this, in, in, the, in, the, rea in the reality of your memory, and then taking yourself out and putting your characters there, leaving them there in this very grounded place. That's why I always felt like the workshop was about the earth. Like I always felt like when I got in, I was like, yeah. you know, like you said, like that. that and the yoga got the shows thing. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We had a guy named Han Ong that I spoke of earlier. It was a great, you guys know Han Ong, he's a great folk in a writer. But, um, you know, he would laugh when he was in the spirit of his writing. And, you know, there's electricity in the room going around when you're writing, when everything's interconnected. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, it was joyful. And I remember that I wrote straight as a line based on Han because, mm -hmm. He was, uh, he just would like be <laughs> loving his work, right? And then you got that first, you know, moment where you're like, shut the fuck up! And then it was electricity, it, it infects the room, right? And I remember there was a great moment with the ring where, uh, so I was working on this play, and uh, you know, it's a mother and son, son's down of age, and the son's talking and writing, and he's talking, uh, he's standing in front of a subway platform, and he's about to jump off and kill himself. And he goes, oh, my mom's here. Uh, say hello, mom. Right? And then the mother says, hello. And of course, that was a surprise to me, too. But it wasn't a surprise, because Irene was doing this whole international thing, right. right? And then we were looking at subway cars. And of course, it was going to take place in England. And of course, that in some way, all of that enters the body. And then you go somewhere bigger than yourself. And that moment, I think, that about the workshop that I think is mo most important for me was, Alice Twan, you know, Hanan, people like that, 
You went farther <coughs> than yourself, you did better than you could do, and yet you went to another world. So I see this thing about uh, how our nationalities kind of got erased in some way, but also we kind of joined a, a world. And that world was a very interesting world to join. Because, you know, I'd always felt like, I'm a queer Chicano, I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna do my queer Chicano work. So that's not what was going on. <laughs> that she was pulling, and, you know, and regardless how you feel about it, I think she did pull it out of me. And I, yeah, I mean, I wonder what I feel about that. Tell me, Sheree, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but I do, I do know that she did strip something away. I have a question. I have a question. I work with. I'm sorry. Oh, no. It's just a quick one. Uh, my name is Serafin Falcon. I just want to say thank you so much. Just listening to you, so inspir so inspirational. Excuse me. Just want to ask, where, if anywhere, I know you said you're your tenured professor at USC. My my sister here. Is mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> Where, if anywhere in LA or, or New York uh, or anywhere else, do you teach? Um, do you do you teach workshops or? Uh, I'm going to teach this summer in the Chicago. Pardon? I'm going to teach a one-week workshop in Chicago with Dan and, and in, uh, Notre Dame and Notre Dame. I'll set up down in Notre Dame. Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, the Latino Commons. So I'm so I'm teaching there for one week. I teach I teach master classes because I don't like bureaucracy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I've, I've taught at university, but I always get it, fired. Is it still is it too late to possibly submit? Uh, April 1st. Yeah, April 1st. Mm -hmm. yeah, the deadline was yesterday. Um, uh, we'll, we'll do it again next year, so we'll let you know. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, you, you guys teaching somewhere? Yeah. You teach at Stanford. Stanford. This has been a Stanford forever. Before she went. I've been a artist in residence at Stanford for many years, like uh, almost like about eighteen years. Wow. And it's, I just, um, I just something. I was just very fortunate because it's not a tenured position. It's it's a position that, um, like, as an artist in residence. So I actually, they kind of found the program, mm. found the position. I'm able to uh, teach uh, not just I teach playwriting, but I also teach Chicano theater. I teach <coughs> indigenous identity and diaspora in the arts. I teach so anything that I come up with because I'm not paid by the department. I pay mm -hmm. for me. I can I get to make a class out of it pretty much if I want. So I've been very very fortunate, and um, and also you know the people that find their way to my class you know are um, you know I have I always say. So little sources, you know, like, you know, students of color and queer students and, you know, just a lot of, it's been very good. You know, it's good teaching, but I'd like to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, definitely, you know, my means influence in, in, in how I teach is, is every, every day. Like you were saying. Yeah. Uh, Bob, because I know you guys and I work with a lot of the students from Irene. I think before, I mean, then the, then the 80s or the 90s more. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a question, they always came to me when I was going to direct their play and they say, you know, Irene told me you were going to destroy my play, so I had to take care of my play. So, I meaning the beginning relationship, how was that? I mean, was that true? Is that the way she felt that your play should not be directed by anybody else except yourself? I mean, that's a part of the class? Yeah. Yeah, she did feel that way, and I think she, I, th I think she wanted to make sure that we knew that we needed to be present and yeah. we'd be there to be, be protected. Because often playwrights are treated like babies. Mm -hmm. like, oh, we're going to teach you what you did. Oh, look, you know, this is what this is about. It's like, really? Mm -hmm. I wrote the blueprint. I think I know what it's about. Mm -hmm. So it's like, but being brave enough, some, especially when you're young, it's hard to always speak up, especially if you're working with a director who's who's very experienced and 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 seems to be taking care of you, but that's the dangerous thing. When people start yeah. taking care of you and managing you, it's like, jump back, because they, you, you take care of yourself. But you have to be an equal with your director. That's how I always felt, and that's what I think Irene always criticized me. She always said you should direct the first, the very first, first workshop production. for a production of your play, so you can really understand right. what it means for it to live in space and breathe. Mm -hmm. I never did that, because I, 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 I don't have those gifts that Irene had. Mm -hmm. But she did give me a really good gift, which was one of my first like big professional gifts was uh, going to the Goodman Theater 
in the old days of the good men. And my dramaturg was a woman named Susan Booth, who runs the Alliance Theater now in Atlanta. And uh, uh, and she, she had a letter from Irene. <laughs> so I gave it to Susan, and, it, and Susan was like, oh, you study with Irene. And uh, it was one of the best experiences of my life, because it was like dramaturgy through Irene. You know, like she knew Irene. And mm -hmm. so she was like, okay, we're going to honor vision and visual and all of that. And Henry Godinus was the director. Mm -hmm. I remember Henry was like, we totally know Irene, right? So there was that kind of great, like, you were of the school, now we know how to. But it was like your mother sending a letter. I wish I just gave one of those notes. <laughs> yeah, that was a good note to, to give, like, I am her student, and don't follow me. Right? That's good. Milcha, I worked with Milcha for five years, of course. Yes, he did. And, and uh, you know, I remember when I was going to do her first play, she was mm. so like, you know, she's the one who talked to me a lot about Irene. Mm -hmm. You know, and I worked with Jose, Jose Rivera, he had taken the workshop. Mm -hmm. And I did Luz Alimer, and then I did Octavio. You know what I mean? A lot of them who had gone through the workshop. And, it was very interesting to me. I never knew. I mean, I've still, I never done an Irene play. I think the one that had overshot the most is the conduct of life. Yeah. And, and it's always been, you can see that she wants to keep to herself what she knows when you're trying to direct that play. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful play. Yeah. But you know what I mean? She keeps a lot of secrets how to direct that play well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? As a director, when you're trying to deal with the play, you know, there's a lot of secrets in that play as a director that she's not giving to you or putting in the page, you know, which there is There was a moment at the Signature Theater, just to end with this, that, you know, at Signature Theater did a Irene's play for the season, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of us went to see all the plays. I remember that was Cuba and Mud, but in between, I always remember there was a wonderful talk back. You were there. Morgan Janess was on the panel, and Lila was on, you were on the panel. I think I was on the panel. Yeah, and there was a great moment where they were talking about exercises and director, and, and there was a director talking about directing Irene's work. He said, so when I did Irene's work, I did this. And she said, no, no, no. She was in the audience. She was, no, that's not what you did. And then during when I said, the, the person went, do you remember this? The person went like, no, okay. And then she said, and I also did this thing with water. She went, no, 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 it was, it was dirt. And the, the director said, okay. And then, and then I realized in that wonderful moment, Irene really controlled that entire experience of what the director thought they did, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's part of, it, even in her writing, it's part yeah. of the writing. It's interesting. That to be you know, I have to say, what's interesting is always the way people talk about Irene. I just think what they say, you know, when they say, Shh. I always love to see how they talk about Irene. They say, shh, 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 shh. I always love to see how they interpret how she was speaking. But I always felt, for me, she was the maestra. And no matter what she said, I believe. And, um, you know, I got to sit with her and watch her plays. So if I had been in that audience and she was saying, no, 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 I would have just fallen for every word that she said at any moment. I was a, a, mm -hmm. a follower and a believer. The audience did trust you. You also acted for her. Yeah, right. did, 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 what did you say? The audience didn't... Uh, they did. They did. They fell for every word. They fell for every word. I do even want to quote, but I just really have to say that. I know, I know, I'm sorry. But, just, but there is a little subtext going on work, right? I'm just going to, that's I think. And the subject, I'm saying this as a, a, a being a, a California Chicana writer, right? And the, the subtext, I think, is that is this kind of thing of, and Jorge and I talked about this years ago, is these schools. Were you the Luis Valdez school, or were you the Mariana Fornes school? And I don't think uh, lots of people necessarily felt that, and, and um, uh, in particular, if you're not Chicano, you didn't feel it. But, but if you, um, so, okay, well, I, I'm not sure quite what I want to say about that, but I felt it. I felt that there was a tension yeah. around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we're talking about, particularly in the 90s, when I, a lot mm -hmm. of stuff was being done. And, and also as a woman, so as a Chicana in particular, and then as a queer Chicana too, that, that of feeling this enormous, enormous gratitude for El Teatro Campesino, for the whole, all of Esperanza, you know, mm -hmm. my brothers are here present right now, you know, they're my brothers, right? Whether they recognize me all as a sister, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, our yes. history, we have our histories, right? But still this kind of, you know, nation, mi pueblo, you know? 
And, and it's very complicated because, you know, I read my books. You know, I never even said those words to her because I knew she would, you know, discount them. Because she is right that you're dead in the water as an artist if you're, you know, in any way writing politically correct or you're, or you're keeping those as a, you know, you are dead in the water, right? And what we, and what our movimiento as teatristas uncovered, of course, was that there was an amount, a huge amount of censorship going on about what could be said in Chicano theater. And then you have this burgeoning of these single playwrights. Most of the individual playwrights were not emerging through the Chicano theater mm -hmm. movement, but they were moving, emerging through one single maestra, mm -hmm. which was Irene, right? So, so suddenly, when you're coming out of, this is like a history here, you're coming out of it and you're going, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, and this is not to cite me. I'm just saying we just saw the play, so it's something in common. So you can see the tension in that, in Ghost. You can see the tension between, you know, ah, so, you know, like, I mean, I don't do that, you know? But I, this character comes up, it's this Cholita, and, you know, Cholo, really, not Chola. And in this memory, in this tribute to who we are as a people, but all the issues are not allowed in Chicago theater. Right? Mm -hmm. So that so the, this is, I just want to say that, because I think, Jose Luis, that's what you're also speaking to, that it's not just that also, you know, where is that, where, where, how do we walk now? And do we, we as individual playwrights, has our politic on some level really evolved and been responsive to our Pueblo? With all of the lack of censure, if have we as, if we become individuals, are we still responding to our pueblo? Mm -hmm. And I think that's still a question mark. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like like, and I know that the like you have a conversation like this. I know it is, and I also know it often isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just a. I'm just saying, as the kids say, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs>